everybody, it's Miss Hamill, and I'm here to talk to you about population ecology. So if you remember from last lecture, a population is a group of individuals of the same species that live in the same area at the same time. So here we have um, a group of monarch butterflies, and they are living at the same place at the same time, so they are considered a population. Okay, some key words that you need to know would be density and dispersion. And density is going to be the number of individuals per unit area over volume. So the example we have is there are 47 elements living in a kilometer squared. Dispersion is going to be the spacing among individuals within a population. So we have clumped, uniform, and random, and we'll talk about each one individually. So uniform dispersion is when organisms are dispersed pretty evenly throughout a population. Um, this is when environmental conditions are uniform within the habitat that they live. And this is going to cause competition or antagonism between the organisms living there. So they're going to compete for the same resources. Clumping is the most common and it's going to um, be led by social behaviors and reproduction. So if organisms are clumped together whoops, and live in areas that are close together, then they're likely to find a mate. So the optimal density is usually intermediate or medium between each clump. So they're not quite large, they're not teeny tiny, they're medium between each group. And then random, this is a rare dispersion and this is going to basically have no competition and no tendency to group or clump and conditions are uniform within a random population but this rarely happens it can be seen in trees though okay next we have factors that influence population size so there are three factors that we are going to talk about that influence population size it will be the number of births the number of deaths, the number of individuals that leave or enter a population. Um, so immigration is going to be individuals that enter an existing population and emigration is going to be individuals that leave an existing population. So number of births and immigration cause a population increase and number of deaths and emigration will be population decrease. So reproductive episodes that help lead to population size are clutch size, and this is the number of offspring produced at each reproductive episode. So humans, we typically only have one child per birth. Sometimes we see two, but it's rare. Um, sometimes we see more than two, but that's even more rare. Clutch size um, for other organisms can be quite large. Um, alligators, they have, um, they produce um, clutch size is around 20 to 30 and sea turtles from my research in grad school we found that most clutch sizes are between 80 to 120 depending on the species of sea turtle okay and then more reproductive episodes sample parity this is a life history in which the organism spends most of its energy in growth and development and then expend their energy in one large reproductive effort and then die. Um, many insects do this. Um, annual plants do this as well as salmon. So they will um, grow, develop. When they have babies, they will have a ton at one time and then they die. So they don't really care for their young. Then we have interparity, and this is a life history pattern in which organisms produce fewer offsprings at a time um, over many seasons. So humans, we have you typically on average about two and a half is the average um, babies per household or children per household. So typically between two and three children. Uh, panda bears, they have a slow reproductive rate and they produce young very slowly and only have one baby at a time. 
Okay, so how do we estimate our population so size? Well, the mark and recapture method can be used to estimate the size of a population. So what we are going to do in our lab is this activity. So we're going to capture, mark, and release organisms and recapture and count. And this is the important equation to know. So N or population is the number of marked times the total number catch the second time over the number of marked recaptures. Okay, so the patterns of population growth, there are different types. We have exponential and logistic growth. And the exponential growth occurs when ideal conditions with unlimited resources. So this is very, very rare in nature um, for there to be unlimited resources. This is called the J-curve because it is shaped like a J. And an example would be one bacteria reproducing every 20 minutes and it could produce enough bacteria to form a one foot layer over the entire surface of the earth in a day. Could this happen? No, because there aren't very many resources or an unlimited amount of resource for that bacteria. So no population is going to exhibit this type of growth for long. So patterns of population growth continued. Exponential growth cannot continue indefinitely, as I just said. It is characteristic of populations who are entering a new environment or those whose numbers are rebounding from a catastrophic event. So if there was a, a natural disaster that wiped out most of a population, they can reduce, reproduce and rebuild their population and it would be like that J curve for some time and then eventually would decline. Our strategist, they can grow exponentially when environmental conditions allow. When conditions worsen, then their population is going to summit. These organisms have a short lifespan. They reproduce early in life. They are going to have many offspring with a large clutch size. They are usually small in size, the organisms themselves. Um, they have little to no parental care. And some examples would be bacteria, some plants, insects, some fish, sea turtle are an example as well. So patterns of population growth, the next one is the logistic growth. And you can see the difference in the shape of the curve. This is an S curve. And this is a pattern of population growth which takes into account the effect of population density on population growth. So this occurs when resources become more scarce. So as the population grow, the resources also decline. And if you run out of resources, then the population will crash. So carrying capacity is going to be the maximum number of individuals that a particular environment can support over a long period of time. And this is determined by such limiting factors such as crowding. So here we have our fish that are crowded up in the fishbowl and they're dying. So the ones that have more space are going to survive. They will also have more food resources. And the graph is going to level off at carrying capacity. And K-selected populations or equilibrial populations live near or at carrying capacity. So they are called K-strategists and the density stays near carrying capacity. They are large, slow-growing organisms. They have smaller population sizes, they have long lifespans and slow maturation. So they don't have babies until older in their life. Um, they produce few young, so small clutch sizes. They reproduce late in life and they care for their young. So most large animals and endangered species fall under the category of K strategist. So here we have some bear. You can see the mama bear hanging out with her baby bear. So here's examples of carrying capacity. So you can see here that Daphnia, this is going to be in a lab situation, reach carrying capacity right about 
here. So in the lab, about 140 Daphnia per 50 milliliters. Then here with bacteria, or I'm sorry, paramecium, um, and in the lab, the number of paramecium is about 900 in the lab. And the carrying capacity for the sparrow is going to fluctuate over time. But the highest carrying capacity is about 70. Oops. Okay. Whoop. All right. So boom and bust cycles are going to be cycles that are cyclic. So you can see here we have our hair and we have our links. So the links is represented in the red and the hair is in the black. So the links is going to feed or be a predator of the hair. So when the population of the links goes up, then eventually the hair population will go down because they are eating the hair. Then the population of the links is going to go down because the lynx have no more food. So once the hair, or I'm sorry, once the lynx die off, then we go up and the hair population increases. So this continues over and over and over again. So limiting factors are going to be factors that limit the size of population. And we have density dependent limiting factors and density independent limiting factors. Density dependent factors are typically biotic factors and they're going to affect the density um, of the population. So how big the population grows. So as the population increases, the factors that influence the population intensify. So competition is going to increase whenever the population increases. The amount of predation is likely going to increase as the population grows and disease. If there is a large population, the spread of disease or contagious disease is going to increase in larger populations. Density independent limiting factors are going to be those that are abiotic and they are going to limit the population and it's unrelated to size. So climate, um, if there's a natural disaster that could wipe out a population at one time, it doesn't matter if it's a large population or a small population. Disease that is not caused by a pathogen or not contagious. And pollution. So if there's pollution in an ecosystem, well, let's say a coral reef that really impacts the organisms that are living there. So these are typically abiotic factors. So interaction, interaction between limiting factors, the density dependent and density independent li limiting factors are going to work together to regulate the size of a population. So deer in the winter time are going to be impacted by the winter conditions. So they starve from a lack of food. That would be a density dependent limiting factor. And the reason why they starve is because the winter is rough. So they have a se severe winter and an increased depth of snow, and that's going to determine their access to food. And this is a density independent limiting factor. So survivorship curves, um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about in this lecture, we have type one, Organisms are going to live to old age and then die. This is most large mammals. Type two, we have a constant mortality rate. So rodents, lizards, hydra, so they, they die pretty quickly. And then type three is high mortality at a young age, but if they survive, they live a very long life. So our examples here are our human, so they live a nice long life and then die at an old age. Then we have our rodents, they pretty much consistently die um, at a constant rate. And then our high mortality rate here, we have an oyster, they die pretty quickly, but if they survive, then they will live for a long time. All right, that's a little bit about population ecology. Stick around for our human 
geography and our human ecology portion.